All right, I need everybody's attention because I got to kind of speed through this if we can. And we've got quite a bit to go over. And for those of you that are going to be catching this later, hopefully you'll be able to see as much as I'm going to put up here and what this means and why. So uh, first of all, thank you, everybody, for being here. But what I want to, you're welcome to come up here. It's a little warmer up here. And you might be able to see the board. Yes. So come on up. I start out with <clears throat> kind of beating up myself a little bit. <clears throat> um, as many of you who were here last October, September and October, and going into November and December and even January, you heard me say that come the third quarter, certainly into the fourth quarter, we were going to be robust because interest rates were going to come down quite a bit. Well, all I can say is I'm, I, you know, I'm kind of like the weather people. I don't, I'm not right all the time. So I'm beating myself up. I was not right on that. So I want to talk about that a little bit as to why things are where they're at when all of the, in, most of the indicators point toward we should be probably and certainly not above low sixes and probably in the mid fives right now, but we're not. So we're going to take, we're going to kind of dissect that a little bit today. So where did I come from last November? I mean, why was I so bold to say that interest rates are going to come down? Some of you may remember the middle of November of last year when the CPI came out on that, uh, on that Wednesday. I mean, immediately, bam, interest rates dropped one full percentage point that day. That hasn't, and I think I mentioned back then, that hasn't happened in, you know, good gosh, 20 years or more. I mean, it's just unbelievable. So you've heard me say that long-term interest rates don't follow the Fed. We follow um, inflation. And I showed you all the charts and everything else, and I still stand by that. But So why, if inflation has come down so substantially since November, why have long-term interest rates stayed up? And that's what we're going to look at this morning, kind of dissect that a little bit. One of the first things I've got up here, it says goalposts. Now, if any of you are in sports, let's just take football, for example, because it says goalposts. What would happen to the game of football if you didn't know where the goalpost was going to be in the end zone until kickoff? How would that change the game of football? I mean, think about where the soccer net is if you're, if you're playing that type of football, all right? What if you didn't know where that was going to be, if it was going to be in the middle, if it was going to be back five yards, up five yards, over on one side or the other side, until the game started? You could take any sport and start looking at it and saying, well, wait a minute, that changes everything. That changes everything. What if they put up for baseball, what if they put up soft fences and said, we're going to shorten the field today. Yes, it's 390 to left center, but today we're going to put up a fence and it's only going to be 320 to left center. How would that change the game of baseball? So that is one of the things that's happening. The Fed and the investment community keeps moving the goalposts. They're not looking at the same thing. If they were looking at the same thing they looked at last November, interest rates right now would be in the low fives. But they're not. Why? Because they've moved the goalposts. And we're going to talk about the key indicators, what those goalposts are. So I'm not going to write them all down. I'll have it in here. But the first one is the one that we talk about all the time, CPI, Consumer Price Index. That's the number that we looked at last, year, last November. It's the number that we looked at two weeks ago when it came in at 3%. 3% versus 9.1% a year ago. That is gigantic. And yet, long-term interest rates have stayed the same and, in fact, recently have gone up again. So, Greg, why does that make, not make sense? Goalposts. Indicator number two, you've heard me talk about it, core CPI. Core CPI is the Consumer Price Index pulling out food and energy. So all of a sudden, they've decided, look, we are going to look at core CPI. 
because core CPI is all of a sudden the goalpost that becomes so important. Well, core CPI last month dropped down to 4.8% from 5.3, the single largest drop we've had in the last nine months. But interest rates didn't come down. So they decided to move the goalpost again. So now there's another number. They have what they now call the super core CPI. They pull out food and energy, and they pull out shelter costs. Shelter costs are housing, which does not. Now, we're in real estate, so we are all thinking that that means what you pay for your home. It also includes rent. Back in the 70s, when they didn't like the shelter cost numbers, Jimmy Carter decided in his administration they're going to make some changes, and they did. And they started measuring shelter costs more heavily on rent. So rent plays a big deal in shelter costs. So you've got shelter costs. So now they've got CPI, which is what we used to always use. Then we have core CPI. Now we have super core CPI. I want you to think about that soccer game where you walk in and there's no goals up. And everybody's playing and they're getting ready to start the game and all of a sudden the goals come out. One is put on one side of the uh, kind of left, uh, left corner, you just put it in the right corner. Everybody's looking, what are you doing? You can't do that. Well, you would think that with our economy, you can't move the goalpost, but they do. But that's not enough. We also have something called the PCE, personal consumption expenditure. And that number has become very important because that's an indication of how much money you and I are spending. So CPI is the amount of movement, up or down, on the prices that we pay, but PCE is how much we spend. So PCE, guess what, has been coming down, has been coming down, 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 down. So that's not enough. So now they've got what they call core PCE, which strips out certain elements, which I don't, I mean, logically, why would you move the soccer goal or football goal away from the center of the field. Why would you do that? Just to screw up everybody. So they can't make up their minds, so now they've got all these other numbers. And then, now they're saying, well, shelter costs are changing. Shelter costs are changing. And you know how they, it, has anybody heard them, the term recently called the median price or the median rent? Go back to high school or college when they talked about the different way to get an average. The median average is the middle number. So say that there are five numbers, five prices. If you want to get the median, you take number three, the middle one, right? It's not the mode average, because the mode average is totally calculated different, but the median average is the middle one. Well, what happens if you go six months down the road and the sales you're looking at were on the low end, the new sales or the new rents versus on the high end, what would that median number automatically do? Go down and vice versa. If you're going to just look at the median and you're going to say, well, the, the ones that we're looking at now versus back then, the median the higher numbers are the ones that sold, so the median price has gone up. So you can't just use median as the number that you and I are experiencing. It just doesn't make sense. There's so many more factors involved. But that's why I say goalposts are being moved and these key indicators are driving us crazy because it's keeping our pricing up. So now, Let's go to the July CPI, which is coming out in a couple weeks, or a week. All right. If you were to look in my book, I have a couple of arrows. And they point in the up direction. Because there is a chance that when they announce CPI, this month, which is CPI for the month of July, they announced it in August, we may see something slightly above 
Now, we haven't had that happen since last June. It's, it hasn't been there. So does that automatically mean that everything, that interest rates are going to even go higher into the eights? No, it doesn't. Because remember, they've moved the goalposts. So why is this number potentially going to go higher? And it has to do with what happened last July and June. If you look at the month over month number between June of 22 and July of 22, July of 22 actually had a negative number. Well, when you factor in that negative number on a year over year number, it is just possible. So don't, I'm putting it on camera. I am not saying CPI is going up. What I am saying is there's a chance it might go up a little bit. I'm further saying I don't think that's going to have a horrible impact on our rates because of all of these things we've just talked about. Make sense? You with me so far? All right. Now, T-bill yields. You've heard me say for a very long time, mortgage interest rates typically track on a daily, hourly, usually daily basis by what's happening with the 10 year, U.S. 10-year Treasury bill. Well, the U.S. 10-year Treasury bill recently has had uh, some interesting things happen to it. And one of those we mentioned a few weeks ago, the Bank of Japan. The Bank of Japan just decided they were going to raise their yield on the long-term bond. They went from a half percent to one percent. Immediately, our yields went up. Immediately. Why? Because our government wants to keep selling their yields. So they didn't artificially raise it, but it just automatically went up. And then the following day, it subsided. Why did it subside? Because Japan moving its yield that much, when you look at the size of their bond market versus the size of our bond market is very small. So they said, well, it's probably not going to have quite as big an impact on us as we thought. So our yield softened a little bit. But that's not enough. So the other thing that's happening with the T-bill, with the um, which is going to take me into servicing values, we've had an inverted yield curve for a long time. By that, it simply means that the two-year is selling for, you know, you're getting a better deal on the 10-year than you are on the uh, two-year than you are on the 10-year. Well, here's what's happening. In the mortgage business, it is expected that when you take out a mortgage, the servicing company, the company you and I make our checks out to every month or they automatically take our payment, when we do that, they're expecting that quote unquote average person is going to keep their mortgage for somewhere between four to seven years. That's how they make money is if we keep our mortgage for some period of time, typically four to seven years. If it's less than four years, eh, they don't make very much, if anything. If it's more than seven, boy, they love us. But now when I say they're going to keep that mortgage that long, it doesn't mean you're going to be in the house that long. It's going to be, you're going to be in the mortgage that long. How many people think that today, if you get a mortgage, at seven, seven and a quarter, six and three quarters, seven and a half. How many people think you're going to be in that mortgage for more than two years? Nobody's raised their hand. So what's happened? Servicing values are sinking on all the mortgages that we are currently writing, homes that you're selling. So as a result of the servicing values not being there, they are art of, the rates are artificially high for all of the things we've been talking about, but just on the mortgage side, they're high. Has anybody had a complaint as you're get, working with a buyer that says, I don't want to pay any points. Can't I just get a par interest rate? I see Rip nodding his head. Yes, I'm getting that all the time from people. Why? It's hard to even find a par rate right now. Jeff was in the business years ago. Jeff and I both know, you used to have par rates all the time. Meet par rate meaning no points to get that interest rate. And you could buy points to get the rate lower. Today, there is, there is no par rate. 
in for the most part. Every once, in, every once in a while on a day you might see one, but they're not there. Reason why is they know the servicing value is in the tank because you're only going to keep this mortgage at 7.5% or 7% for less than two years, probably, probably less than a year. Well, they don't want to lose money, so what do they do? They add points. They say if you want to get a 7.5% interest rate, you're going to have to pay something to get it. A 7% is going to cost you even more, but there's no par. That's the reason why. They're making the money up front rather than over time because there's not going to be over time. We're going to get out of all these high, high interest rates over the course of the next 9, 12, 18 months. So that's why you're seeing that. There's one other thing about servicing values that this gets a little technical, but I'll do it quickly. Normally, the spread between the Fannie Mae, Freddie, Mae, Freddie Mac rate and the 10-year Treasury bill, normally, that's about 200. We call 200 basis points. The spread is about 200. If you look at the T-bill, look, look at mortgage interest rates, there should be about a 200-point spread there. Well, today, it's been like this for months now. It's actually been as, as high as three and a half. Right now, it's running at about just over three. So we're way ahead. Now, by the way, if we went from 300 to 200 tomorrow, interest rates would immediately drop into the low sixes, immediately. Because that's the trend over the last 20 years, but not today. And part of that is because the two-year, we talked about the inverted yield curve, two years doing good. So the spread between mortgage interest rates and two-year is running right at about 200. We've got the strangest market that I've seen in my 33 years. Why? They keep moving the goalposts. So bottom line, what does all of this mean for you and I? Well, the first thing is there's absolutely nothing you and I can do about this. This is just what it is. Should you and I have become experts at this and try to explain all this to the consumer? My opinion is no. <laughs> I'm not going to try to. I'll probably do a video on it because it makes me look like I know what I'm talking about when sometimes it's just like, I pray to God I'm not going to be wrong like I was in November. <laughs> but the bottom line is, is that we can't affect it. But what we can do is we can take bits and pieces of this information and put it out there for people. If all they saw, if all you talked about were goalposts and key indicators, if that's all you did, you would look super intelligent. And there's nothing wrong with that. That's all you really want. You want your clients and potential clients and their friends, when they're viewing your videos, to just think that, hey, you know what you're doing. And by the way, if you want to get a lot of views, wear a pink shirt. I was telling the group I wore that crazy pink shirt last, and I love pink. And I'll wear that shirt again. But I, after all the comments I got when we were here on Monday, I did a short video on it, and it's got over 300 views in the first three or four days it was on. And I'm like, wait a minute once. There wasn't nothing of value there other than the fact that I had a pink shirt on. But you want, we want to look intelligent. Here we go. At least that. The further down this chart you get, the more confusing that it gets. So where are things going to go? Well, I think history ultimately will repeat itself. I will stand by what I've said in the past. Mortgage, Long-term mortgage interest rates do follow inflation. It's been like that for as long as I've been in the business, and it, I don't think that's going to change. On the short run, they're moving the goalposts. Yes, it's not happening, but it's going to. Now I'm going to give you a fact. This is a fact. The last four presidential elections, 08, 12, 16, and 20, in the year of the election, interest rates came down. Last four. Didn't make any difference, nothing political. Who got in office, who didn't get in office, all the garbage that went on, but went down. Now, 2020, obviously you could say, but Greg, that was COVID and interest rates went down. Let's go back to the beginning, uh, middle of 2019. From middle of 2019 through the beginning part, through before COVID hit, 
Interest rates were coming down. Very heated presidential election. Interest rates came down. 16, they came down. 12, they came down. 8, they came down. If history repeats itself, we're probably going to see a softening in interest rates simply because we have a presidential election. Now, am I predicting that'll happen? No. I'm simply stating a fact. The last four, it happened. History might repeat itself. Now, could you imagine what would happen if history repeated itself with the presidential election and they put the goalposts back to where they're supposed to be? Oh, my gosh. We'll be in the low fives, maybe the high fours. Now, if that happens, we have a whole different problem. And we can talk about that some other time. But the problem then is going to be these tens of thousands of people that are sitting on the fence waiting for the rates to come down are going to jump off the fence. And how much inventory do we really have today? None. This much. You're right. So I'd rather have that problem than the one we're having right now. How about you? Yeah. Absolutely. All right. Before we break, anybody, I can maybe take time for one or two questions, and that's it, if anybody has anything. If not, perfect. Thank you.